welcome to our next panel, which is uh, Next Generation Surgery and Rehab, uh, AR, VR, and Health and Medicine. Here, stand up. Uh, we're lucky to have a really great panel here with us today. Um, uh, increasingly, AR, MR, VR are being used in uh, new and novel ways. Uh, nowhere is that more true than in health and medicine, the health and medical spaces. Joining us today are three innovators who are bringing new technologies to the operating room and the rehabilitation process. Uh, Dr. Jayander Jagadijan uh, is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, uh, research associate at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, and an associate member of the Broad Institute. Uh, Bro is Bro Broad Institute. Uh, Ryan J. McKindles and Jeff Palmer are both members of the bio, uh, Bioengineering Systems and Technology Group at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, um, where Dr. Palmer uh, leads the MIT Lincoln Laboratory's Bioengineering Group that focuses on human health performance research using uh, engineered biosystems, biosensing via wearable, ingestible, implantable devices, objective uh, neurocognitive analytics, and immersive reality uh, sensory motor environments, um, which is a wide array of different things. Um, so before we kind of get into uh, some questions, I wanted to each give you an opportunity to kind of explain what you're doing uh, in this space, and you have some, some slides to kind of give examples and, and some videos that I can help you play as you want to go. So, Jander. So, what I wanted to do first was give you a broad perspective of the research that we are actually doing in the lab. So, uh, the work that we're doing is more in the field of image guided therapy and surgery. So, the idea is to provide as best a picture for the surgeon while they're doing surgery or to the interventional radiologist when they're doing therapy. So the idea is to see if you can provide intraoperative imaging, identify the boundaries of the tumor, provide this to the surgeon intraoperatively so that they can guide this uh, surgery uh, in real time. So what we have is we have um, a state-of-the-art operating room at Brigham called the Amigo Suite, which is the advanced multimodality image-guided operating suite. It has the MR, it has PET-CT, it has ultrasound, it has molecular imaging, all these imaging modalities integrated with the uh, surgical suite. The idea is to provide as best uh, an, a picture of the anatomy to the surgeon while they're doing surgery. So let me give you a quick example of one such application that we're actually looking at. So this is for lung surgery. So uh, I'm sorry if this is making people queasy, but just to give you the idea of what we are doing over here. So the idea is if you have a very small tumor, uh, the problem becomes localizing this tumor becomes very difficult. So if you have a balloon and you have one particular point in the balloon, you're trying to identify that point. So what we try to do is we pl place intraoperative uh, fiducials into the lung. We identify where the tumor is and then use intraoperative imaging in order to uh, excise the tumor itself. So you can see the two uh, fiducials. And these two fiducials are used in order to localize the tumor, so you know precisely where it is. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is you're using intraoperative imaging with navigation in order to localize the tumor and excise the tumor. So you know precisely where the tumor is, and you can ensure that you're removing minimal amount of lung around the tumor while resecting out there. The other is intraoperative MR-guided uh, parathyroidectomy. The idea over here is to use intraoperative MR in order to localize these adenomas. These are very, very small tumors of the parathyroid gland, which is just behind your thyroid gland. Uh, it could take easily about eight to 12 hours just to fish out this, uh, the tumor itself. So what we have started doing is using intraoperative MR in order to identify where the tumor is and then provide this to a navigation system, which we have developed in the lab. And in, in real time, we provide this feedback to the surgeon. So you can see inlaid, uh, you can see the surgeon trying to localize the different uh, structures. This is through a very small incision. So using the navigation system and providing all these different views, you can identify the tumor, which is in green just below the thyroid gland. So you have different sorts of feedback that is provided. So the idea over here, as you can see, is that there's a tremendous amount of information that is being provided to the surgeon. We're providing, it's like a GPS, right? So one of the things that we're trying to see is if you can provide this information interoperatively in an intuitive fashion. So we started looking at using the Oculus Rift. We have modified the Oculus Rift with two cameras in the front, which provide the view of the, uh, of the uh, surroundings itself. So this is the view that is provided. These are all virtual monitors. So we're looking at laparoscopic surgery. So you can see the laparoscopic video. You have the navigation system video, um, the video from the navigation system. You can pull in any of the patient-specific imaging uh, while the pay, uh, surgeon is actually doing this procedure. So you can scroll through the images. You can look at the diagnostic images. You can do the planning. So you don't need multiple people telling the surgeon what to do. 
And you also have the view of the surroundings, the operating room, and the, uh, uh, and the technical people around. So we also started looking at the using the HoloLens for surgical planning. And this is the concept of uh, you know, mixed reality. And going back to what Ronnie was saying, sometimes it becomes very difficult for the surgeons to identify the uh, geometric perspective of where the tumor is or where the stone is. So we started using this for kidney stones, for temporal bone defects, identifying where the uh, defect is, as well as for uh, lung tumors. And this is still in the surgical planning. We would hope that some of these devices could also be used for guiding surgery. So I'll just skip the next video, which is for diagnostic uh, imaging. Um, and uh, this is for diagnostic imaging, but I'll let uh, Ryan and Jeff take over. Uh, th thank you, uh, and thank you, Dennis, and uh, the organizers for having us here today. Um, it's been, uh, been pretty enlightening so far. I'm looking forward to uh, a lot of the other talks today. Uh, so I, I come from a perspective of uh, a mix of academia, uh, national lab, uh, type environments on the research side where we're doing work in uh, uh, VR, AR, and even uh, uh, mixed reality as well. And then also uh, uh, from a perspective of trying to uh, really engage this community to bring some of these things together from uh, some of my work with IEEE and uh, EMBS, the Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society, where we've been having uh, international challenges to bring in lots of different information from IoT systems um, and uh, AR systems to actually provide real-time uh, data that helps someone accomplish a mission. I think we'll talk about this a little bit later for some of the challenges, because uh, that's where we've really seen uh, the challenge that's highlighted. Um, at Lincoln Lab and MIT, one of the things uh, that we like to do is we, we want to center on the human and understand how does a human uh, better interact with their environment, obviously AR and VR helping with that. Um, from the idea of remote presence and also teaming. So how can we extend their presence and their interpretation for multiple data streams uh, to help, say, a first responder um, or someone who's dealing with disaster relief understand a situation to make better informed decisions? Um, one of the other things we like to do is look at how people are interacting with other people. Um, this could be on a cognitive scale. It could be for psychological health, uh, remote uh, presence for telemedicine. That's another area we're actively involved in. Uh, a third area is how do we interact with autonomy, Aut autonomous systems specifically. We're, we do a lot of autonomous system development at our lab, and so we want to understand how are the humans interacting with that. Um, there's a lot of uh, questions on what are the right ways, what are the wrong ways, what are the ethical uh, limits of that. Um, and finally, how do we interact with ourselves? Um, this is where a lot of the medical work within my group is also centered in trying to understand um, not only uh, for guidance on surgery, um, but also for understanding cognitive uh, status, um, psychological health. Um, some of the modalities that we have for VR lend themselves not only for how do you see the environment and how does all this data flow so you can understand the environment better, it also um, points back to you. Um, so some of these uh, basic sensors that we see in commercial systems we think can be exploited to give more information about the user themselves. And so, or someone you're interacting with in that virtual environment. Um, a lot of this uh, it can uh, be evaluated and really extended um, in a research environment uh, that, in which we look at sensory motor responses especially. Um, and uh, Ryan will talk about some of that work. Thank you, Jeff. Um, as Jeff was mentioning, um, we do a lot of work, uh, we're, uh, we do some work right now in uh, sensory motor control. It's more my background in neuroscience and biomedical engineering. Um, we reopened a new center recently called the Strive Center. The heart of the Strive Center is this computer-assisted uh, computer assisted rehabilitation environment. It's a 24-foot dome, immersive environment. Uh, the inside of the dome, 360 degrees, um, is actually immersed in this virtual environment. There's a platform that moves in six degrees of freedom and has a split belt instrumented treadmill. It also has motion capture, so you can measure all the kinematics or the the joint angles and the kinetics or the forces. Uh, we also have wireless EMG, EEG, um, respiration, basically all the types of physiological monitoring devices you could imagine we've started to integrate into this VR system, which makes this, this is uh, one of three in the world of uh, this type of dome system. We have a number of different ways we'd like to use it. Uh, this is built in our new Strive Center. Uh, it stands for Sensory Motor Technology Realization in Immersive Virtual Environments. Uh, we've developed this new center to be, have kind of a clinical feel so we can bring in uh, people who post spinal cord injury or stroke and have them more comfortable in these types of environments. We also have a workshop that allows us to do rapid prototyping um, or uh, fixing of new types of sensors that we're developing. 
And so these are the four core areas that we've identified currently for work that we're doing at the Strive Center. The first is clinical. So this could be clinical rehabilitation. It could be uh, treatment. Um, there's a variety for both a variety of different projects we, we are currently thinking of working on in this area. One this fall that we're starting is actually uh, with Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, uh, looking at ways of delineating different types of mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI um, in the in the normal population, but also for the warfighter. Um, operational, so this could be for a first responder, uh, instead of having a firefighter go through a burn house, having them go through 20 virtual burn houses in an afternoon to learn different architectures, to see how they make their cognitive, or to see what types of cognitive decision making uh, they're doing and then training them to be better uh, over time. Uh, technology development, this could be new types of exoskeletons. This is back to what Jeff was mentioning about how do we work, how does, how do humans work with technology, especially if they're wearable or mounted technologies like exoskeletons? If we are moving, how is the exo moving in relation? Is it actually inhibiting us or is it actually assisting us in what we'd like to do? This could be for um, increased ability or agility, but it also could be for rehabilitation over time or it could just be a, a, a new type of exoskeleton for someone who's had a spinal cord injury to walk again. Um, in terms of Technology development, we're all think, also thinking about how do we make these immersive environments better? So how do we make them more real? How do we make them feel more real from a visual perspective, from auditory perspective, et cetera? Uh, and lastly, training for success. This is in its most raw form, taking a novice in some sensory motor or cognitive skill and making them an expert in an expedited amount of time. So bringing in experts, benchmarking them, saying this is what they do, and then using biofeedback in some type of uh, way to actually train them more quickly. So. Fascinating. So. I think what we want to talk about now is, you know, these breakthroughs and, and these unique ways that you were using these technologies, uh, there are challenges with it. And I think part of the challenge is kind of the, the breadth of the, of the healthcare uh, and medical worlds. And, and that's something we've, you know, we were discussing beforehand. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges? I'll start with you, Jeff, and then we can come back to you, Jander. But what are the, some of the biggest challenges facing you as you try to apply these technologies uh, in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, some of the things that we've seen, especially for challenges where we've opened up um, a specific challenge to accomplish a mission, um, in this case, uh, doing, say, a medical evaluation. Um, one of the things that we've seen uh, is teams come up with really unique, uh, novel ways to attack the problem. Some of the problems they have are when they want to use this, it works well in a prescribed way. Um, when they need it to adapt, specifically in, in a, say, a surgical condition. Um, we heard a, a great analogy uh, earlier today about how we'd love to have a, a linear line between how we want to innovate um, the idea, the ideation, and the final result. Um, life doesn't work that way. It, this idea of having to go around all the rocks and boulders down the hill rather than the waterfall is closer to the truth. So adaptive uh, processing, adaptive uh, architectures for that are really important. Um, and it's usually how do you deal with changes in the data that's flowing into your AR system. Um, the other is individualized. Um, we heard a little bit about that as well, how people respond differently to, say, uh, 3D. Um, some of the people that have used this type of system uh, for immersive reality um, have tried to do a 3D overlay with disastrous results just for the same reasons you heard about today. Um, so individualizing it and their individualized response, what they uh, need to know, and so we can learn from them is another big one. And then uh, finally, the ability to do this in a robust fashion, especially when the stakes are a little bit higher for some of the medical decisions. So I think from uh, using these devices in the surgical suite, I think there are two aspects of it. One aspect of it, the challenge is the accuracy. So the accuracy is both in terms of the content that you're providing to the surgeon. First, the images have to be accurate. The models that you're providing have to be accurate. They have to have good spatial recognition of where the defects are or where the tumor is, what the extent of the tumor is. The second aspect of it is performance. You have to have you know, devices which provide good resolution with minimal jitter possible. So if you saw one of the HoloLens, uh, the video that I showed, I think when you start rendering lungs and you know, large amount of polygons, then there is a significant amount of jitter. But there's one thing which as engineers we always uh, forget, you know, to bring it into the OR, there are a lot of other factors that need to be considered. The first is, you know, you have to make sure that you're addressing a clinical problem which actually requires the device. If you're not addressing the clinical problem, it just, it, all the results go into a journal paper and that's the end of the, uh, the use of that particular work. So it has to address an important clinical question. The second aspect of it is also it has to be easily adaptable in the OR. 
So if you take, for example, breast conserving surgery, the surgery lumpectomy, it's about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. You don't want to be adding another 30 minutes just to set up the device. So you're doubling the procedural time. And the third aspect of it is also you have a lot of human factors involved. So if you take, for example, a neurosurgeon is always using a microscope. So how would they be using this particular device when they're using it for neurosurgery? Or if you're looking at, you know, using magnifying glass or loops around the surgeon, how do you integrate these devices with uh, the loops or any of the other devices that they use? So there are a lot of other factors that we as engineers don't actually pay attention to. And so it's very important to actually work very closely with the surgeons to identify what the clinical problem is and how do they actually do the surgery and how do we integrate these devices with their surgical procedures itself? And so, excellent. And, and Ryan, you might be able to answer this question. So um, one thing uh, that this space lends to that is that a lot of experimentation. So as you're applying these new mediums, these new technologies, you're not really sure which one best applies, um, whether it's uh, AR, VR, uh, mixed reality, or or even the type of devices that might be best as you you know as you sh you guys are trying the, the Hololens and you're trying VR. Um, how do you kind of navigate that, and how do you figure out what is best, and and how long is that process? So it's a good question. As Jay was mentioning, you know, it's very specific to the application that you're trying to apply it to. So one way that we it, obviously, there are many disadvantages and advantages to every one of these different types of technologies for immersive environments like we have in the Karen system. Um, one thing I like about it from a neuroscience perspective is I can see myself. So my subjects who are in there, I, they can see their hands moving and they can see what they're actually doing and it feels more natural. They also don't have the, when they move their head, um, there's no delay in the, in the images. Also, we have the ability to uh, have very good peripheral vision because of the, the wraparound screen that we have. Um, so for that type of application, that is the right tool. Um, it's also the right tool for doing something like um, new types of sensor evaluation because you are the, have the ability to run, um, you have the ability to you know, make the grade of that treadmill or of that platform extremely high. Um, it's extremely flexible in terms of the types of inputs and outputs we can use it. So one of the ways we want to use this drive center is kind of this bridge between a lot of the laboratory work we've already done in sensory and um, physiological monitoring and bringing it, uh, using it as a bridge to bridge to real world applications because we can develop a lot of really cool things in the labs, but if it's not um, translatable, it uh, becomes a problem. Um, but in terms of other technologies, you know, if you want it, something that's portable, the Strive Center is not portable. <laughs> you know, taking a $2 million, you know, dome and trying to build it in every hospital is also not possible. <laughs> um, so one way that we'd like to use this center is to you know, we have a lot of the technologies already. Can we learn what aspects of VR, which aspects of AR, MR are actually helpful for whatever that study is looking at? So whether you need peripheral vision, maybe you don't for certain applications, maybe you don't for surgery because you're so focused in a very small field of view. And in that case, um, you, you should not be using like a large dome like we're using. Uh, but for something like telepresence, where you want to be able to see a large area, you want to be able to see out in the environment in many directions very quickly, you know, there are better applications for that. So using kind of this dome and other types of technologies, figuring out what are the most, the, the thing that actually translates to the real world, and then figuring out which of the different technologies is best for that application is, is very vital. So my answer to the question is, uh, we don't know which device would be useful for any application. We really don't know. I mean, so we test out all the different possible devices. We test out the Oculus Rift, we test out the HoloLens, but we do a validated study of you know the application. For example, the Oculus Rift, right? So we actually add it to uh, cameras. It sort of lends itself very well for real-time imaging. So we have now a study that we're doing where we have residents, surgeons, fellows who come in, who do a particular task using a validated surgical uh, it's a surgical box which they use for laparoscopic trainers so it's a validated uh, metric that we actually use and then we actually evaluate if such a device actually improves their performance and that's the only way in which you can validate if a particular device is useful for a surgery or not and so we have tried the Oculus Rift. We're also working with the HoloLens. And one of the things that we'll have to evaluate is the accuracy of placing the models exactly on the patient where you want it. So that's the idea of using the HoloLens for surgery and therapy, where you can actually look through the patient. You can see where the tumor is uh, using the HoloLens. And for that, um, the accuracy becomes a very big question. And if you're providing this information to the surgeon, you have to have it within a, a millimeter to two millimeters uh, error. 
I'll just say one other challenge that we've really seen and, and it hasn't been solved, and so we open it up to really the community to solve is integrating a lot of the sensing of the person who is in putting themselves into this virtual reality with what they're seeing. Um, a lot of times you'll see the goggles on, and I think it's missing a lot of it's missing half the equation. It's putting you in that environment, but it's not having that environment adapt to you as quickly. Um, and so I think there needs to be more sensing of the person all in the same system when you put on. Um, so it's sensing you. There's a, a group in uh, California, Institute for Creative Technologies, that's trying to create uh, an AI component with the medical. Uh, <laughs> the, now we have some mood lighting. Um, <laughs> an AI component uh, with a, a medical avatar. So it adapts to the person who's in there. So as it's doing, say, a, a psychological evaluation or a cognitive evaluation, it's actually learning from you and asking questions, maybe even changing its tone based on how you respond. That has a much bigger value and much bigger impact uh, for those types of applications. So I, I, you go ahead. You know. One other thing that Jay, Jay had mentioned before was um, about metrics. And we, we don't have great method, metrics for healthcare for using these types of devices. And I think it's a very important field um, that IEEE, ISO, and others will start to explore. Or I've already been exploring and will explore more over the next few years. Because if we don't have a way of kind of benchmarking how well this is for different, uh, these different technologies are for different applications, um, we just have a lot of really nice white papers that really just don't go anywhere. So, um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. But we'll you know, move uh, to the, the iLab people have other questions, um, hopefully we can answer them. Um, this has been, I think, enlightening uh, for everyone in the room, um, and certainly me. I, I learned a, a lot in the, the past 25 minutes um, about what's happening in the space, and I uh, thank you so much for coming here. So thank you very much for being here, and thank you for sharing. Thank you.